My name is LaDonna York, but I'd like to thank Chuck for inviting me. I really appreciate that. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Chuck for inviting me and having me here to talk about how important it is to help change uh, the world through giving to those who need it. Every man, woman, and child deserves the right to enjoy life, but unfortunately, circumstances make that really difficult for in many, many cases. Helping others however we can, I don't know if we call that our duty, but wiser words were never spoken throughout history that deal with reciprocity then from leaders through, uh, like Confucius, Lao Tzu, and even what we now know as the Golden Rule. Seneca, a Roman philosopher, even said, wherever there is a human being, there is an opportunity for kindness. Again, I'm LaDonna Work, and I'm, with, I'm a founder and director of a DFW Atheist Helping the Homeless. <clears throat> I have three children, two are grown, and one is still working on it. I'm a full-time student and I'm working towards my bachelor's in psychology. But I, always, I wasn't always the person that you see here today. Um, 20 years ago, I was on the other side of, of organizations like mine. I was on the street with my twin sister Elizabeth and my biological mother. We spent time in homeless shelters just so that we could have a place to stay dry. We found food and shelter wherever we could. Things weren't easy for my mom. She was struggling with mental illness, and Elizabeth and I were just really along for the ride. My mother's family had a very active role in putting her onto the streets, and us as well. Rather than treating her men mental illness like I'd like to think that most of us would today, they chose to, to tell her that it was you know, a demon that had possessed her, and, and so therefore uh, her homelessness was a natural consequence to her turning her back on God. As, as they saw it, um, because otherwise she wouldn't be mentally ill, right? So she responded with an over-the-top intensity. Um, uh, church and godliness were very, very important to her. They were her highest priority. We went to church every single day. Two to four hours of reading every single night of names and spirals. Uh, to offer up prayers on people that she met throughout her life. I mean, literally, we had four spirals, and we would read them all night. She, she did street preaching every day because we were homeless. We were on the buses, and so she would do street, street preaching every day because she thought that that um, was a way that, that she could express and could at least be closer to God. My early childhood, though, was kind of a grab bag. Uh, when we weren't with our mother, we were with our biological father, where drugs and alcohol were just a really a, a part of our life every day. It was the polar opposite of um, when we were with our mother, of course, and going back in, in between both places, it really forced us to, to be very duplicitous in our personalities. Um, and when we weren't with them, we were bouncing in and out of foster care. Uh, it was in, in, in the 80s in Texas, that's how it was. You would go live with your mom, and then you'd go live with your dad, and then you'd go to foster care. And then they'd clean up their act, and you'd go back, and it was just a swept spot all the time. <clears throat> but when I was in foster care, my foster parents were also Pentecostal. So <laughs> that didn't change for me. I still su was subject to uh, religious indoctrination very heavily. Um, but I can honestly tell you, as a, as a Christian child, I volunteered hundreds upon hundreds of hours in the name of their God. Finally, I aged out, which means I turned. Sorry. Finally, I aged out, which just means I turned 18 um, and was able, uh, or you know, I had to leave the foster care system and got out on my own. Um, I 
And out of all of the religious abuse I suffered at the hands of my very, very sick mother and my father and throughout the system, um, the one thing that I could cling to and held on to and kept me sane was service to others. So that's what I did. I just constantly volunteered. I was constantly involved in many, many activities and just kept my mind on the prize. Even when I was on the streets, I volunteered with my mother at different um, organizations, even the ones that were helping us. Service became a way of life for me. Even after we permanently were separated from each other, since then, I've never stopped looking for volunteer opportunities. I'd always known that my biological mother had given me a gift that would last a lifetime, and that's service. The positive takeaway from my childhood is that I learned how to give. I've been around a lot of people who have had difficult childhoods, and while I don't really feel like my childhood was much different than anyone else's, but we all have different things that we had to take away, and for me, it was to, of service. As an adult, I volunteered for many of the same organizations that helped me as a child, but I couldn't get over the phoniness of it all. The religious hand that dealt out help to the most vulnerable of our communities really just made me cringe. I founded um, DFW Atheist Helping the Homeless because I wanted to give people what they needed without strings attached. In doing so, I discovered that thousands of um, atheists are looking for service opportunities. But religious religions seem to have a monopoly on the volunteer movement. And they, they have a side benefit, or they, they use it as a recruitment tool. I believe that a side benefit of my organization is that we are benignly challenging the myths surrounding atheism. Nonprofit organizations drive social change. We've seen that in action with religions. They provide the necessities that most of us take for granted. Giving through nonprofit organizations is an expression of private action for the public good. Social change is necessary to accomplish our, our goals. First, we want to help those who need it, and second, we want to change the negative perceptions of atheists. Things, these things lead to a growth in society, but it is an uphill battle. Mr. Heyman wrote in his book, uh, Nonprofit Management 101, the nonprofit sector is a highly effective expression of American pluralism, providing a stabilizing means for voluntary community, building, and public benefit. It makes possible evolutionary rather than revolutionary change. In order to change the perceptions about who we are, which is simply put, a bunch of people who don't believe in a deity, we need to show them. We can argue about how factually incorrect or how impossible the religious texts are, but we all know, really, that that doesn't work very well. Instead, showing others that we don't fit into their narrow worldviews through our actions is what's most likely to make a difference. Perceptions of atheism are already shifting, whether that's because more people are doubting their faith, because they have access to verifiable information, or whether it's because famous people are coming out or being outed as atheists. Things are changing for us, and we need to keep the momentum going, guys. Having a formal organization such as DFW Atheists Helping the Homeless, whose members share a passion for nonprofit work and aren't afraid to share their affiliation with the group, help lends credibility to the point we're trying to get across. We're not evil, and we're not misguided, and we don't hate their God. We don't proselytize either. All we want to do is provide a no-strings-attached help to those who need it. There are thousands, maybe more atheists, who are searching for ways to pitch in. Whether it's Doug Stanhope encouraging atheists to donate disaster relief, or atheists giving aid collecting funds for accident victims and terror victims. Atheists are showing, that the, that showing this country that we are just as kind, just as giving, and just as compassionate as everybody else. Let's take a look at the stats. Over $316 billion was given in the U.S. in 2012. That's, that's a lot of money. Uh, for the most part, charitable giving has risen steadily for the past 30 years. In 2012, individuals donated nearly $218 billion, which accounted for 73% of total giving. Almost three-quarters of the money donated last year came from people like you and me from all over the country in all different walks of life. 
Foundations gave $41.67 billion, and direct bequests accounted for just over $24 billion. And corporations, they only gave $14.5 billion in 2012. Don't raise your hands, but think about what you did last year. What did you contribute to a nonprofit organization or charity of your choice? Would you have given more if you'd had the opportunity? Would you have been able to encourage others to give if there was a means for you to do so? Did you limit your chari charitable donations like many people do because of the lack of organizations that you could really, really connect with? Whether you discover that the Salvation Army is actually a large church with a mission of spreading a biblical message, message or you just couldn't get behind an organization that spends money to enact discriminatory policies with one hand while passing out food and clothing in the other. The amount of money you chose to donate last year may have been different, and it's the same for other atheists as well. So where does all the money go? Almost half of all charitable donations, 48%, go to religious organizations. Just 13, 12, and 9% go to education, human services, and grant-making foundations. There's a huge disparity between religious organizations, um, donations, and those who, that could be construed as secular donations. It's absolutely huge. Where do all these donations go? According to the Washington Post, only a third of charitable contributions actually go to the poor. They estimate about 20 billion goes to the poor. So we still wonder, where does all this money go? <laughs> now, <laughs> million adults volunteered 15.2 billion hours of service in 2002. The top four national volunteer activities were fundraising and selling items, which accounted for 26% of those hours. Food collection and distribution came at uh, nearly 24%. General labor and transportation made up just over 20% of those man hours, and tutoring and teaching made up about 18%. The majority of these volunteer hours were spent volunteering for religious causes. Almost 27% went to educational causes. A little over 14% went to social services, and 8% went to health services. The Indiana, uh, Center, the Indiana University Center on Philanthropy and School of Public and Environmental Affairs put out a report on the differences between religious and secular charities. They found that among religious and secular charities that provide health or human services, Secular charities are more likely than congregations to serve only the general public rather than their own members. Secular charities are also more likely to target their services to low-income groups. In a nutshell, that means churches and religious organizations are more likely to give in-house or to their own members before seeing to the needs of others, even the needs of low-income groups that may have had greater needs than, than their own members do. This in, this in and of itself isn't really that bad, but it does say something about the choices that they're making um, in compared to the choices that secular organizations make. The same study also found that secular charities that provide health or human services have a harder time getting funding. In fact, 70% of them named secular funding or securing funding as a major challenge to their organizations. But what all this really means is that there's a big need in our society for secular nonprofit organizations. Compared to religious organizations, there are only a handful of secular nonprofits. And with all the with all the fundamental differences between the types of giving between the two, America is desperate for the kind of no strings attached, non discriminatory help that we can provide. People in America want to give. It's generally just a matter of finding a worthy cause. Naturally, in some states, people give more than others. Sorry. This map, courtesy of the Chronicle of Philanthropy, breaks down the amount of charitable donations by state. Online giving is seeing an explosive growth, too. Our own foundation raises a significant amount of money through social media. And since we're able to reach a broader audience of atheists, humanists, and secular givers, we're able to help more people. 
On the high end, some states are seeing an average online donations of more than $11 per person. That's, that's pretty significant, and that's really huge. That's how online giving can help your organization do more good. And that's good news if you're ready to start your own secular nonprofit. 62% of tax-exempt organizations that filed tax returns in 2009 has assets under $100,000. Those are really encouraging numbers because it shows that you don't have to be huge to make a real difference. In fact, sometimes smaller organizations are more effective than large, overburdened ones that get caught up in red tape, politics, and other messes that stop them from doing what they intended to do to begin with. Even if you don't want to start a nonprofit, what I hope that you take away from this is, and, uh, is that your time is the absolutely most valuable asset that you can give your community. When you donate your time, you're helping those who need it. And at the same time, you're serving as an ambassador for the atheist community. And that helps to strip away some of the unfounded, sometimes off the beat or off the wall beliefs people have about us. You're helping atheism move forward towards acceptance, and that's long overdue. I shared my personal story earlier to help illustrate that we all have a story to share and tell. Like me, you have your story, your children, your friends, your neighbors, they all have their own stories as well. These stories shape our lives, and they give us a basis for action. They're a unique opportunity to identify and fill a need in our communities. Whether you grew up with a parent who struggled to, to keep or find a job for any number of reasons, or you're from a community that traditionally doesn't have the educational resources necessary to give kids the best start, there's very likely something in your life that can serve as your springboard, something that, you, that, something that can help you help others. You might have watched a friend battle addiction or battled it yourself. You might be a former military service member and, and know what kind of scars that war can leave on you. We can each take what we've learned over our lives and transform it into something big. Not necessarily big by society standards, but big to the people you help. One of my favorite stories is the starfish story. There's a little girl and she's walking up and down a beach where thousands of starfish have washed up over a big storm. She'll take a few steps, bend down, and pick up a starfish. Each one she picks up, she tosses back into the ocean. The little girl does this every single chance that she gets. She does it so long that people start to take notice. Finally, a man walks up to her, and crouch, as she crouches down, picking up what must have been her hundredth starfish for that day. Little girl, he says, what are you, why are you doing that? There are thousands of starfish washed up on this beach. You can't save them all, no matter how much you do. You won't even make a dent. You can't make a difference. And she said, I can make a difference. And when she threw that last starfish in, she said, I made a difference for that one. So for the people who need you, and for the people who think you're all the things that you're not, you can help make a difference too. And that's all I have. Okay. I'm curious about the specifics you do with helping the homeless. Do you just give money? Do you do you go out there and, and give counseling or talk to them or give them blankets or, or what exactly is Well, right now we're really a grassroots organization and we go right to the street. Um, we've only been around for a year and we, we, we service about 300 homeless every month. We do about 150 in Fort Worth and 150 in Dallas. And I have tables and bins and we give every toiletry you can imagine um, from body wipes, Q-tips, shavers, all of it. Socks, underwear, we do underclothing and um, books, condoms. I give out a lot of condoms every month. That's something that other religious organizations never do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I love it. I love it. So, um, yeah, we, we do a lot of things, and we do some individualized help. We never give out money. That's highly inappropriate to do for homeless um, because it can be used. Many people who are homeless are either mentally ill or um, struck out on drugs, prostituting, 
that kind of thing, and so money is just not a good a good idea. But we do some individualized help where we do like bus passes. Uh, we had, um, and we ask our donors. We on our Facebook page, we said, "What? We have this guy. We have an atheist guy. He's living on you know in a friend's house on the floor, and he needs stuff. He has he has rheumatoid arthritis, and he's 60, and he's not able to work." So can, what, what, what can y'all, what do y'all want to do for him? And we put out a list of all the things that he wanted. He wanted a, a tape player with headphones. And people came through. People came through with $500 for him. And we were able to do three months of bus passes for him and get him started so they could get back on his meds and get on disability. Yeah. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Are you your small organization, limited budget? Um, <clears throat> are you a 5013C, and how much did it cost you to form your 5013C if you are one? We just filed, and it was a four hundred dollar fee. And we had, you know, we did most of the. I did most of the. I did all of the work myself, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's hard, but it it's definitely worth it. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Be the last one. Last one. Okay. So, LaDonna, you're working in the Dallas-Fort Worth area mm -hmm. as an atheist organization, and I'm just wondering if you could share some stories about reactions you get from people when they see that you're working with the homeless as an atheist and as an atheist group in Dallas. How, how do people react? Well, people look at me and go, really? You're not an atheist. There's no <laughs> way. I get that a whole lot. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. Okay. So, um, the thing is, is that when we go to the streets, we don't tell the homeless people that we're atheists. There's no purpose in that. The main thing that, I mean, is that we don't want to do what churches do. We're not trying to um, change the homeless' perception of atheists. Sometimes they ask and we don't lie. We don't like hide it, but we don't have banners out there or anything like that. And we've had a few times, three times out of several times that people have asked us, people thrown our stuff back at us. And that's what it is. It is what it is. But most of the times that doesn't happen. Most of the time I'm really, um, uh, we're, we're like, people are really happy that we're doing what we're doing. And so I, I don't really have a whole lot of problems with it. They just, they just can't believe it more than anything else. And they, they just really are shocked that we're atheists. And I think that's why, that's one of my message that I wanted to bring was, I think we need to have more atheist nonprofits. People are scared to put atheists in their name. And to put that with the secretary of their state or the IRS, but I'm telling you, it is worth it because it's changing people's perceptions, and that's what I really want to do for the atheist community. Thank you, guys.